And I asked him why that the victims are always afraid to testify for themselves and for their families back home, and why couldn't you use something like the Witness Protection Program to put them in? And he went through an elaborate a d discussion with me about why that wasn't possible and said that he is using a, the Mann Act, which doesn't require that, to, uh, y you know, prosecute many more people, which I, I don't think they can be prosecuted for the highest level of the crime. I think they have to be prosecuted for the lowest level of the crime. Anyway, he said he would be glad to engage in a discussion further with me about that particular issue, but I do think that that is a huge problem. Um, the other thing is, with respect to a journalism issue, there's a great story out there about sex tourism. There is a whole industry of sex tourism that was not mentioned. I think that would be great to be exposed. Well, I would say, say, I feel as if I've seen a lot of stories on sex tourism, but, but back to Mike's point and everybody's point, and Noy's point earlier, they're headline stories. They're sexy headline stories, and then nobody follows through on them. So we are probably guilty as charged on that. Question back here? Yes, right in front. Hey, Ford from Free the Slaves. Uh, Mike, I was wondering if you could talk about the AB visa, the problems with it, and what you think the solutions are, because you brought it up. I wish, I wish my colleague Mark Morris was up here because he concentrated on the H-2B visa problem, but it's a very serious problem. And as he pointed out on one day of our series, the, uh, the amount of fraud in this visa program is, is amazing. Uh, the Department of Labor was given millions of dollars by Congress to go out and find the fraud and correct the problems. They gave the money back. All of um, during, uh, I urge you to talk to Mark more about this because um, it's a very serious problem and people within the Labor Department will tell you it's always been a scam and, and will continue to be until we get serious about fixing it. Uh, let's take a question from over here. Yes, ma'am. I'm Kara McLaughlin, former director of the Massachusetts State Task Force, uh, presently working on a national campaign to end First of all, I want to thank the Schuster Institute, in particular the founders and the funders. I so appreciate what you've done here today. Knowing the work of a lot of the panel, I, I do want to say a big thank you from the bottom of our heart to expose these issues uh, to the Kansas City reporters. Your team did an excellent job in working on the visa issues and really exposing those issues of how we're working on those difficult what's going on with Vic volunteering for prostitution. And Noy, your victim-centered approach is just amazing, and I thank you so much for all the quotes and all your articles from those victims. We really take that to heart. I have three or four things that I'd like to just have people consider and love your opinion on them. One is we really need to be careful in this field, especially because it's so many different types of victims, about victim parity and really understanding that if we're taking a, a point of view or talking about one type of victim, that's really not the full scope of what we see. So when we're talking on labor, we really need to really be sensitive to what's going on with the sex trafficking and the commercial sexual exploitation of children and adults and all the range of these crimes. Because I see some really, as you have put it, Lynn, headlines, headline grabbing stories about cherry picking certain kinds of victims for those headlines or for that, sorry to put it out there, but really that's what I see. And the second thing I'd like to recommend is that we really go deeply. You're all people of honor with a lot of interest in doing due diligence. And we're seeing a great deal of imposters in this field right now. As we see in many humanitarian fields and after many humanitarian disasters, we need people who are going to go out there and really help us dig deeply for not only people and expose them, but really be out there to find the best practices that we challenge you all to do and we are challenged to do every day. I'd also like to offer the bland subject of public policy. We don't get enough reporting and we're not doing cutting edge public, public policy change. Lastly. Demand gets no attention because it's not considered sexy, interesting. It has no victim exposures. 
ask people to consider what we're doing in that regard. The end is we really need to still go back to those victims. They are really the truth-seeking people that we rely on a great deal, and along with them, your voices. So thank you for this time, and any comments you might have, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for your comments, and I, I'm, um, as I said, nobody on this panel is uh, guilty of doing the bad stuff. Um, sorry, uh, another question from the audience. In the back, yes, go ahead, sir. Can you hear me? Yep. My name is Elliot Prassy Freeman. I'm an associate fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights. I've been looking at this stuff, actually the discourse around it for a couple years, and I'm um, interested in an almost an erotic fascination with the traffic victim, the female body, especially the exotic erotic, and wondering, kind of in connection with some of the things that you guys have been talking about in the media, I, I don't necessarily think that people want to see this problem go away. They, they quite like it. And I'm wondering, as journalists who respond to this this issue and write about it, can you talk about the process in in with your editors or um, when you're pitching a story? If this phenomenon ever occurs, where that kind of context, um, the hum humanization of the victim that Noy spoke of, is actually kind of uh, not encouraged. And of course, I could be delving into like Zilakanian psychoanalytics, and you can tell me I'm I'm an idiot. But I'm wondering if there is a, if there's anything here because we see such an explosion in anti-trafficking reporting, and I'm wondering why that is, where it's coming from, where it's going, and why is it never about victims as people, but only as spectacles of violence? Thank you. I would, offer, I would offer one comment, which is unfortunately there are not enough good editors in this country, mm -hmm. but that's a separate issue. Uh, Noy, let me ask you, because you've been dealing with that on a regular basis, what do you think? Do, first of all, is he right? Oh, yes. I am <laughs> so glad that you asked that question. It is. Um, um, it, it was kind of an obsession of mine to look at the discourse as well. And I noticed the ways the victims were just posited as broken bodies or vessels that had been shattered and therefore needed to be put back together again like Humpty Dumpty. And um, with this kind of emptiness of body, what happened was and then they became the kind of repository for a series of, I would say, kind of projections about the nature of dignity or, um, you know, um, choice and all these other kind of, um, I think, uh, anxieties and, and phobias that we have around sexuality and what happens when ping people get mingled up together with money. Um, and so um, it has been something that I have spoken about more than written about, um, but it is a huge obsession slash pet peeve of mine. Um, I really dislike the way that um, victims are imagined and never rep allowed to represent themselves. Um, because the moment they are seen as um, three-dimensional people with their own um, motivations and internal economies of meaning, the less likely it is that people who would try to help them would misunderstand them and try and create policies that actually put them at a disadvantage. So um, you know, thank you so much for your question. And uh, the way I try and uh, counteract that is by really avoiding any kind of salacious detail that actually a friend of mine who works for UNESCO, he calls it uh, redemptive, redemptive Victorian pornography. So I try to studiously avoid that, and I try to show the ways in which um, you know, people came to the situation and how people leave the situation and what the fabric is of their lives that actually have in common with the reader. People have families, they have dreams and goals, and uh, this is just a moment in their lives, the one that can affect them for a long time, but um, there are stories of, of resilience and of their own representation that really need to be told. It is a challenge, however, and so we'll see how we all continue to try and do this.